you know, um, legalism and religion, they put walls between us, barriers. But the amazing grace of God just smashes through those barriers. The amazing grace of God breaks through those barriers. You know, we're, uh, we've been going through the book of Acts. And actually, in these first few chapters, most of what's been happening has been around Jerusalem. There's been an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, but Jesus has said to the disciples, the apostles, that this gospel is not to stay in Jerusalem. It's just to go out. It's to spread out to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And I love that. You know, legalism puts boundaries between us, but the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ smashes down those boundaries and opens up the gospel to the whole of the world in an amazing way. So I thank you. That's what's going to happen on the streets today. We're going to have an opportunity to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ to those passing by on the beach, to those sun revelers on the beach as they see people baptised, go under the water, this incredible testimony of the faithfulness of God. The gospel is beautifully inclusive. It's beautifully inclusive. Religion says, stay out. You need to reach a certain type of uh, standard. Is there a bit of a ringing? Yeah. Maybe I won't speak so loud. Speak louder. Speak louder. Okay. Maybe you don't need the microphone. But religion wants to separate us, but the gospel of grace opens up the gospel to so many others. And so we're seeing that in the book of Acts together, that these barriers are being broken down, surmounted, cultural barriers, you know, barriers between ethnic groups of people, barriers between social classes, barriers... Uh, between you know, men and women, barriers between those who are older and those who are younger, barriers between those that have and those that are not, have not, are being broken down by the wonderful gospel of grace. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 8 and verses 1 to 8 initially, and we're going to go through different parts of this uh, chapter together, and we're going to look at just this gospel, and it's, it's at work in people's lives. And we're going to see in the next um, few verses, we're going to see a Samaritans coming to know the Lord. We're going to see an African coming to know God. We're going to see a Pharisee coming to know God. And in the verses over this, we're going to see a Roman soldier coming to know God. Cornelius comes to faith in Jesus Christ. And so the wonderful gospel of Jesus keeps spreading out and nothing is going to stop it. So we're going to read from Acts chapter 8 and verses 1 through to 8 to start with. And the words are going to be on the screen, but follow us, you know, follow it in your Bible if you've got them or on your phone. But on that day, actually right back at verse 1, and Saul approved of their killing him. Remember, Stephen had been martyred, he'd been stoned to death. Um, in, uh, in Jerusalem by the religious people of the day. And Saul approved. Saul was there. We know that Saul becomes Paul later on in the story, but Saul was there and he was looking after people's coats as they were killing and martyring Stephen. Saul approved of their killing him and the church persecuted and scattered. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mounted deeply and mourned deeply for him. And Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Philip in Samaria. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. And with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. 
I want us to just look at three things this morning. I want us to see that roadblocks create new opportunities. I want us to see that God has called us as followers of Jesus to run alongside people and to be with them as they walk the walk with God. And I want to also see that it's always all about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. The gospel always comes back to Jesus. You know, the spread of Christianity starts here in Acts chapter 8. And it starts out of sadness and pain. You know, we all encounter difficult times in our lives. What I like to call roadblocks. A few months ago, about 18 months ago, I had a brain tumour. And I found myself in hospital after being unconscious for a few days. And during that time, I felt like a number of things sort of closed down. It was like a big roadblock in my life. And you know, trials and situations that we go through, it could be persecution as it was in the early church, but difficulties and challenges create roadblocks in our lives. But you know the wonderful thing about roadblocks, if we approach them in faith and with the grace of God in our hearts, they provide new opportunities. You know, I believe that actually, even though I know God didn't give me the brain tumour, but I believe God used it to set a new course in my heart, a new determination in me to say, I'm going to live this chapter of my life for the purposes of God. And you know what? I just felt today as we start to go into this chapter, there are some of people in this room who you're experiencing roadblocks. And it feels like things have come to a halt. And there's a big sign there saying, no further. And when Stephen was martyred in Acts, the church must have felt, is that it? And they must have felt like maybe let's just retreat. Let's go back to our homes. Let's, let's forget what Jesus said about taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And when trials come and when difficulties happen in our lives, everything within us wants to say, I'm going to pull back. I'm going to hold back. But I think the Holy Spirit just wants to say to us today, to some people here in this room, that roadblocks create new opportunities. Whatever you're going through in your life, don't stall at the roadblock. There can be wonderful opportunity there. Let go of the old and embrace the new, because often when we come to that place, there's a new diversion. There's a new place that we're to go. And just as this happened with, with Stephen in Acts, we saw that... Philip, in a bit, we're going to see that his story leads him out into Samaria. And over the course of the following days, you see the gospel spreading out. I just felt this morning as I was praying into this, there's one or two people you just need to know that where you've encountered a roadblock, God's actually creating a new opportunity. And I just felt that for you, Jürgen, today. That he just wanted you to know that where there's been a roadblock, he's setting your course in a different direction. He's setting a new purpose for you. It's not finished. Actually, there's going to be more fruitfulness in the next season. Amen. And you know, it's interesting that Ruth came up to sing earlier on, but I just felt for you, Ruth, it's the same. That you felt like there's been a roadblock. It could have been situational circumstances in your life but the Holy Spirit says to you, I've not finished. There's a season of more fruitfulness than ever coming. And it's important to remember that. Just because there's a roadblock, there's new opportunity. And Andrew and Alison Berry, I just felt for you this morning that you've come against a roadblock, but it's not the end. It's a new season. It's a new season of fruitfulness. There's new opportunities for your life to become more fruitful than ever. You know, and we as a church may have gone through seasons of roadblock and difficulty and, and trial and persecution, but they're not the end. God's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He's got a, a new fruitfulness ahead of us. So when I came out of hospital about 18 months ago, a good friend of mine, Giles Carpenter, he's the vicar of St. John's in Meads, he sent me a card and he just sent me a poem. And I just want to read this to us this morning. It's a poem called Autumn by Mar uh, Parker Palmer. 
but it really just spoke to my heart and I hope it just speaks to so many hearts here in this room about new opportunities, new seasons. But as I explore autumn's paradox of dying and of seeding, I feel the power of metaphor. In the autumnal events of my own experience, I'm easily fixated on surface appearances, on the decline of meaning, decay of relationships, the death of a work. And yet, if I look more deeply, I may see the myriad possibilities being planted to bear fruit in some season yet to come. In retrospect, I can see in my own life what I could not see at the time, how the road close sign turned me toward terrain I needed to travel, how losses that felt irredeemable forced me to discern new meanings I needed to know. And on the surface, it seemed life was lessening, but silently and lavishly, the seeds of new life were being sown. You need to hear that. Some of you need to hear that, that God is doing a new thing in you. The roadblock is not the end. It's a new direction for all God has got for you. Let's continue to read in Acts chapter 8. I'm going to read from verses 26. I'm going to skip out the section on Philip being in Samaria. But there's an amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Samaria. Many come to faith and many are baptised. And um, we see people set free from the demonic. Um, we see just, yeah, wonderful uh, explosion of the gospel in, in regions that the apostles actually hadn't gone into. But this, this, this disciple, uh, this deacon, um, Philip, went out into Samaria and preached the gospel. But in verse 26, I'd like us to read from verse 26 onwards. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot heard the man reading the Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. Don't you love those divine appointments? <laughs> Philip, by the Holy Spirit and this angelic encounter he'd had, was led to go to the road, the desert road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And when he arrived there, there's a chariot and the chariot's moving. I think we need to know this. The chariot's on the move. And there's a, a man in the chariot. He's an African man. He's from Ethiopia. The, uh, Luke, the writer, is telling us. So he's from the Horn of Africa. Ethiopia at that time was, you know, an ancient um, nation, probably quite a bit bigger than what it is now. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship, the Bible says. And on his way back from Jerusalem, he's on the desert road, traveling from Jerusalem to Gaza, and Philip encounters him there, because Philip, by the Holy Spirit, has been told to go there. Now, what a wonderful opportunity. The guy's reading the Bible. Who wants those opportunities when you sit alongside someone and you realize, oh, you're reading the Bible already? You're open already to what God wants to do in your life. I think we need to see that we can so easily miss this, but when we read the scripture, we can miss the details. But this man was a eunuch. So he was either he was born a eunuch or he was castrated. And it wouldn't have been unusual if he had been castrated because to work in the royal household of many nations 
to ensure the integrity of the royal line and to ensure that there was no misconduct from those who were employed by the royalty, these men or women, they were castrated. They were unable to have children. So this man, there's something in him that is hungry for truth. That's why he's traveled a thousand miles, around about a thousand miles from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. And when he's got to Jerusalem, I'd imagine this is his first time, he's on a pilgrimage, he's seeking something, he's trying to find the answer to life. What's it all about? What's the meaning? And there are loads of people around us who are asking that same question, that are willing to travel a long way or to ask those things or to seek the truth. And this Ethiopian man wanted to know what it was all about. He'd given up, uh, I don't know how long it took him to get there, but it must have taken him weeks to travel to Jerusalem. And there was no remote working in those days. You know, so he couldn't just hop on the laptop and carry on working as the treasurer of, of Candace. He had done something very costly, had left his home in Ethiopia and was seeking something. But when he got to Jerusalem, we know that the temple law, the religious law of Jerusalem and of the temple would have not permitted him to enter because he was a eunuch. Religion kept him out. Law kept him out because he was unclean. And so this man with a deep desire to find God didn't find him in religion. Couldn't find him in religion. Couldn't find him in the legalism of the temple duties. And so he's on his way back from Jerusalem to Gaza and then back to Ethiopia. And I want us to see that I think Philip's running alongside him. I think he's actually, I don't think the chariot stopped. As I read it, I think, no, I think Philip's actually He's running alongside him. And as I see Philip running alongside him, I think, who are we called to run alongside? There are people that God has called us to run alongside. That are just at this time, they need us to be where we are with them. I met a friend, uh, a new friend actually, a couple of days ago. And uh, he'd been living in The Hague for the last few months and living homelessly on the street. And he, um, he hadn't eaten for two days, uh, two weeks. And some of the Christians from the Redeemer Church in The Hague, they were out on the streets of The Hague and they were looking for opportunities to just share their faith. And they were going in one direction and one of them just felt, you know, I, I think I need to go and sit next to this man. So he went and sat next to him. And when he was sitting next to him, he said, I think I should ask him if he's hungry. That's an unusual thing to ask someone you're sitting next to, isn't it? Are you hungry? And the man said, yeah, I've not eaten for two weeks. He had the opportunity to buy him food, talk to him about Jesus, introduce him to the church family. He became a Christian, this man. He got baptised on Easter Sunday. And he's come to join us here in Kings in Eastbourne. Are we, who are we running alongside? Who is the Holy Spirit saying to us? I want you to run alongside this person. You know, I'm I'm rubbish at sharing my faith. I've got to be honest with you. I feel like I'm really not very good. You You won't catch me preaching on the streets. That's not me. But you know what? I feel like the Holy Spirit's just been prodding me over the last few days and he's been saying, but you can run alongside somebody. Who are you running alongside? Who do you need to share the love of Jesus with? There are six people being baptised today and each of them needs someone to run alongside them. And I love how the Holy Spirit knows that and he brings us alongside people 
And it's often people that have been burnt out on religion. They've not found the answer in religion. They've not found the answer in their Mecca or their Jerusalem or their place where they're seeking, where they think the answer should be. But they find it on the desert road, in the desert place, at the end of themselves. And there are people in this town, there may be even people in this room, and you're at the end of yourself. And you need someone to come alongside you and just run. What are you reading? Are you hungry? Let me explain. Let me explain what's happening here. Let me tell you about Jesus. Who are we running alongside? This African unit was searching. Who else would take a thousand mile trip to Jerusalem unless he was searching? You know, it says in Romans 10, verses 14 to 15 in the NIV, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I don't know about you, I want to have beautiful feet. If I took my shoes off now, you would not think they were very beautiful. (laughs) And I figured that as I've got older, they get less and less beautiful. But I want to have beautiful feet. I want to have feet that looks like I've been walking and running alongside some people. So let me help you. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me, un- let me help you unpack what you're going through. I don't know, maybe you're the eunuch in this story. Maybe you're burnt out on religion. Maybe you've gone to the temple somewhere and you found that actually your life doesn't match up. That your lifestyle doesn't allow you to come in. Maybe your sexuality doesn't give you permission to come in. And so you're turning back and you're going back empty. But somehow you've got hold of this this scroll of Isaiah and you're reading it. You're reading Isaiah 53. We know that's what he's reading. He's reading that wonderful section of scripture in Isaiah about the suffering servant. It's all about Jesus. And Philip runs alongside him. And there are people that need to run alongside you because you are at the end of yourself. You're in a desert place. You're in a dry place, but God wants to break in to your life. You're not going to find the answer in the temple. You're not going to find the answer in religious practices. You're going to find the answer on the desert road because you cannot find it in religion, but God finds it, finds you on the desert road. (laughs) God finds us when we least expect it. So maybe you're the eunuch in the story. And then just finally, it's all about Jesus. And I just want to read Acts chapter 8, verses 30 to 35. Pages are stacked together. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture the unit was reading. He was like a sheep to the slaughter. Led to the, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? 
for his life was taken from the earth. I don't think it's unusual that the eunuch is reading this scripture because the man that he's reading about doesn't have any descendants and this eunuch will not have any descendants. And so something in this, these verses is ringing true in his heart. This man sounds just like me. I'm barren, I'm broken, I've been rejected. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And then the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or somebody else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. You know, I'm so grateful that God doesn't want us all prepared and ready when we come to him. I'm so grateful that he, won't, he doesn't wait for us to be perfect before we come to him. In fact, he's willing to meet us right where we are in our complete imperfection and actually in our rebellion against him. He doesn't leave us there. He completely changes us, but he doesn't, wanna, he doesn't need us to be pure and changed and ready to come to him. The African man is reading what in our modern Bibles is Isaiah 53, this whole section of a, a couple of chapters on the suffering servant. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from him. Jesus was cut short in his prime. Whoever the scripture is talking about was cut off the eunuch would never have any descendants of his own. This man has been rejected by Judaism, by religion. And the eunuch's reading out loud and Philip asked, do you understand? Exasperated, how can I understand unless it's explained to me? And the eunuch asked Philip, please tell me, is the prophet talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? Oh church, he's talking about somebody else. He's talking about Jesus because it's all about Jesus. It's only Jesus that can save. And, and Philip is saying to the eunuch as he unpacks the scripture, starting right where he is, and I love how the Lord just meets us right where we are. I always think of the, the, the time when the guys met in the channel, you know, the French team and the, and the English team, they were building the channel tunnel and you think, how on earth are they going to meet at the right place? You, that's, that's a feat of engineering, isn't it? And it, I don't know if you remember, the, I remember it really clearly, I can see the English guy and the French man through this hole in the earth, shaking hands. We made it, we, we arrived at the right place. Amazing. Isn't the Holy Spirit great at bringing us to the right place. The Holy Spirit is brilliant at bringing us into the right situation at the right time. And, and on that desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza, the African eunuch was about to discover a man that was just like him. And as Philip unpacked what he'd read in Isaiah 53, he said, this man is about, this is about Jesus. He was crucified in Jerusalem a few months ago. And he's died for you and for me. And he's died so that we don't have to stay on the outside, but we can come on in. He's died in our place. He's taken all of our mess, all of our mistakes, all of our brokenness, all of our desert, all of our barrenness. And he's given us his life. He died so that we could have his life. And I love that. Let me tell you about this man. And starting right where he was, in the scroll of Isaiah, he told him of the suffering servant, Jesus himself, written 700 years earlier, perfectly and prophetically described Jesus, a man who died childless ahead of his time, a man who was despised and rejected just like this eunuch. His life was taken, crucified, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. 
He broke the power of sin and death. Not so that we could all become a part of his religion. Oh, we don't want religion. The, ch- the world doesn't need religion. The world doesn't need things that separate us. It needs things that unite us, that bring us together. And the gospel of Jesus Christ has the amazing ability to include us into God. That's what the gospel does. And we as a church, it's part of our vision and our call on us to be those who go in mission and service to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, who meets people right where they are, whether they're poor or rich, whether they're broken, whether they think they've got it together, whatever their sexual orientation, whatever their ethnic background, God says, you are all welcome. Come on in. There are no barriers in this place. And I love Hebrews, what Hebrews 2 says. It says, he will bring many sons and daughters to glory. Jesus was crucified in his prime, but he brought many sons and daughters to glory. It requires a turning to the way, the truth and the life. Jesus himself. I love what the amazing hymn says. Were the whole realm of nature mine, were the that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. And now I want to come to the exclusive bit about Christianity. Because contrary to what the world thinks, Christianity is the most inclusive. But there's something incredibly exclusive about it. And that is faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. There is only one way to God. And it's through Jesus Christ. And it's white. And it's open to all. And it's inclusive. But only a few will take it. Will believe in their hearts. That Jesus is Lord. Confess with their mouth. Believe in their heart. When Jesus was crucified, he died and rose again. He made a way for all of us. There's no exclusions. Except one. You need to believe in Jesus. He is the way, the truth and the life. And as the eunuch continued to read Isaiah, just a few verses on, in Isaiah 56, I just want to read again another prophetic word from Isaiah, just as I come into land and just talk very briefly about baptism at the end here. Isaiah 56, 4 to 5, says this, For this is what the Lord says. Now, this is Isaiah speaking prophetically into the new covenant temple of God, the new covenant people, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple, uh, uh, within my temple and its walls, a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. The very temple that excluded the eunuch from worshipping. This temple, the church of Jesus Christ, says, come on in. And in this temple, I will give you a name better than sons and daughters. You may feel that you're broken, you're barren, that you've you've burnt out on religion. But in God, in Christ, and in this temple, the church of the living God, there is a place of blessing. There is a place of acceptance. There is a place where you are included. And then I just want to just quickly just read from Acts chapter 8 and verse 36 to 40 as we come into to, to land. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptised? 
and he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. I mean, this is the only time in the Bible that I know of, or maybe the time with, with Elijah when he was suddenly taken. But he's teleported. Philip is tele- teleported. I don't know how I'd feel about that myself. <laughs> and when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the, and the eunuch did not see him again. But he went on his way rejoicing. And Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. I love the fact that when, when this unit got to Jerusalem, he wasn't included in the temple worship. But on the desert road to Gaza, God met him there and changed his heart completely and radically and wonderfully. You know, baptism is not a ceremonial washing. Jesus has already done that. We heard that when Ruth was singing earlier on. Through the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed. So when we come to Christ, when we come to Jesus, this one who Isaiah talks about in chapter 53, he cleanses us, he washes us, he makes us whole. There's a verse that's not included in these verses here. If you read the verses that I've just read, you'll see that it goes from verse 36 to verse 38 and verse 37. It's not actually included in most of our modern translations. And actually, it doesn't matter, but the reason it's not included is because there's not enough, enough evidence in the, script to, in, a, in the scrolls to say that this verse was originally in there. But I want to read the verse to you because it kind of says the heart of Acts anyway. And Philip said, this is verse 37, and Philip said, if you believe with your heart, all your heart, you may be baptised. And he replied, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. This unit believed that Jesus was the Son of God and he was saved and he was cleansed, every sin forgiven, and then he was baptised. I like to think as baptism, of baptism it's just like a wedding ring. When Lynn and I got married, we shared promises together and vows that we made to one another. And we were married. Legally, we were married. And then we gave each other rings. And the ring said, you know what? I'm no longer my own. I belong to Jesus Christ. I've been bought with a price. And people around us know that we are children of God. And there's something powerful about baptism that says to the devil, to the church, to the world, I am not my own. I belong to Jesus Christ. I belong to Jesus Christ. And when these six people are going to be baptised in a few minutes' time on the Eastbourne Seafront, they're saying, I'm not my own. I belong to Jesus Christ. God has met me. Religion's, religion's not done it for me. Jesus has. He's accepted me. He's brought me into his family. And he saved me. So I want to invite